Other than having gobs of money, being a celebrity can't be easy. Sometimes people might be out to get you, or you just might want to vanish and stay gone. Was well, that what happened to these celebrities? We'll give you the facts and let you decide. Imagine if Lord Byron, Sid Vicious, and a moody teenager all managed to magically meld together and create a single person. That person would look and act a whole lot like Manic Street Preacher's rhythm guitarist and lyricist Richie Edwards, a mid-1990s British rock idol whom The Guardian called a lightning rod of sorts for adolescent angst. Edwards was handsome, moody, and dreamy, with a talent for writing lyrics about depression and an even bigger talent for disturbing publicity stunts. When a journalist with music magazine NME implied his band's posturing was insincere, Edwards grabbed a razor blade and carved for real in his own arm. It's not surprising, then, that when he first went missing in February 1995, it could have just been interpreted as another chapter in his twin stories of self-destruction and self-promotion. However, it quickly became apparent that the young poet was gone for good. Edwards had been due to fly to the U.S. with MSP frontman James Dean Bradfield when he disappeared from his hotel room. His car was later found abandoned near the Severn Bridge, which connects England and Wales. Edwards was legally declared dead in 2008, but no body has ever surfaced. Still, sightings of the musician have reached halfway across the world and all the way to Goa, India, and published in 2019, Withdrawn Traces, Searching for the Truth About Richie Manic, alleges that Edwards faked his own disappearance. Did he? It's looking more and more unlikely that we'll ever know. Here's some advice for any disappointed artists out there. Just because no one likes your stuff now doesn't mean people won't one day be discussing how underrated you are. Just look at Connie Converse. A 1950s musician, she's now considered the first modern singer-songwriter crooning intimate, lyrical ballads suffused with melancholy, long before anyone was talking about Bob Dylan. Not that her contemporaries were aware how groundbreaking Converse was. In 1961, she quit music altogether, unknown and convinced she was a failure. In a happier universe, Converse's tale would now take a redemptive turn. In 2009, a handful of songs she'd recorded in the kitchen of illustrator and audio engineer Gene Deitch were released by Deitch's record label. The album, How Sad, How Lovely, became a cult hit. The New Yorker profiled her. People realized she'd been amazing. Sadly, Converse saw none of this success because she disappeared in 1974. 74 was a bad year for Converse. she just turned 50, and she felt like a failure. That summer, she wrote to her friends that she was going to make a fresh start, loaded up her car, and drove off into legend. No trace of her has ever surfaced, and there's a chance she's out there, way into her old age, maybe even aware that her talent has finally been discovered. If Jim Sullivan's name isn't ringing any bells, that's because he's the definition of a cult artist. A folk rocker who was part of the L.A. scene in the 60s and early 70s, Sullivan cut just two records before heading to Nashville for what was meant to be his big break. He never made it. His car was found abandoned in the desert outside Santa Rosa, New Mexico. His wallets, clothes, and guitar were all found in a nearby motel. Of Sullivan himself, there was no trace. As record company Light in the Attic explained in its notes for the re-release of Sullivan's UFO album, he was a guy who should have been famous. Phil Spector's wrecking crew backed him on his first record. He had a small part in Easy Rider. Oh, and he was an excellent writer of depressed melancholy pop. Had he reached Nashville, he might be up there with the greats. But Sullivan never made it to Tennessee. As one of his friends said, Sullivan would have never left his guitar behind if he planned to vanish. Appropriately for a dude who released a record called UFO, which featured lyrics about driving into the desert and being abducted by aliens, one of the more prominent theories is that he was, you guessed it, abducted by aliens. And like it was just going right across the sky, man, and then... I mean, it just suddenly, yeah, <laughs> it just changed direction and went uh, whizzing right off. Barbara Newhall Follett was a Jazz Age writing prodigy. She published her first novel around age 13, something that's hard enough to do even when your novel is a self-published fan fiction. When that novel is The House Without Windows, a complex work that wins rave reviews in the New York Times, publishing it as a teenager is basically a miracle. Everyone who read the book agreed Follett was going to be the next great American writer. Follett did indeed vanish, but we're not quite to that part of the story yet, and that's not the reason you've never read any of her books. After putting out just two novels, Follett was forced to give up her writing when her father suddenly took off with a younger woman, leaving Follett and her mother penniless. By age 16, Follett was working as a typist and fending for herself. Then, in 1939, the then 26-year-old Follett had an argument with her husband and left the house. She never returned, and no trace of her was ever found. According to literary magazine Lampin's Quarterly, her husband barely bothered to look for her, and the press wasn't alerted until 1966. 
By then, her disappearance was well into cold case territory. If you know Rico Harris, you probably know him for disappearing. The gentle giant vanished one night in 2014, somewhere along State Route 16 near Sacramento. The resulting manhunt gripped the press, but it only gripped them because Harris used to be somebody. In 2000, Harris played basketball for the Harlem Globetrotters, a team so famous that even people who know nothing about sports recognize the name. Before that, he'd been a top 100 college basketball recruit, but substance abuse and injury kept him from reaching his full potential, and he wound up out of basketball and working as a security guard in LA. The final blow came in 2014 when he was fired for drunkenness. He left his mom's LA house to drive to Seattle and stay with his girlfriend. His car was later found abandoned outside Sacramento. A 2017 profile in the LA Times recounts the strange details. Harris, who had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, was known for disappearing for days on end and not taking his medication. This time, he was described as out of sorts. A backpack and phone that had taken a video of him were found on the roadside, but when police searched the wilderness using a heat vision camera, they found nothing. Human footprints were found in sand, and reports of a man walking down the highway trickled in, but Harris was never found. The LA Times suggest he was probably picked up as a hitchhiker. After that, who knows? Canadian band Loverboy was one of the biggest rock bands of the early 80s, with hard-charging hits like Hot Girls in Love and Working for the Weekend, which is still played on just about every radio station in the world every Friday afternoon. Scott Smith was a founding member, staying with the group all the way until his mysterious and frightening disappearance at sea on November 30, 2000. After playing with his band in Vancouver, BC, out of benefit for the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, Smith, two friends, and his girlfriend set out from Mexico on a 37-foot sailboat. As they sailed down the coast and neared San Francisco, the weather got rough, with the seas throwing up gigantic waves. One of them, estimated to be about 20 feet high, knocked Smith off the deck of the vessel and into the water. Coast Guard helicopters arrived within 20 minutes and dispatched two search boats, which scoured a 133-square-mile area to no avail. When fog and continuing high waves ended that search, Smith's family paid for a private search by a San Francisco company, and that too proved fruitless. Smith's remains have never surfaced. Antoine de saint exupéry is the guy who wrote The Little Prince, a children's book of such beauty, such power, and such simplicity that it's tempting to say no life can be declared complete until one has read it at least once. He was also a fanatical aviator and a death-defying acrobat of the skies who once crash-landed in the Libyan desert and spent a week wandering, lost and on the brink of death, before being miraculously found by a passing Bedouin. When World War II kicked off, saint exupéry was desperate to do his bit for his native France. After the U.S. entered the war, he volunteered his skills as a pilot. Unfortunately, aircraft tech had kind of moved on since his heyday, to the extent that the great rider was more hindrance than help. His second ever mission for the Allies, he managed to crash into an olive grove. On his six, he wound up landing on Corsica instead of Sardinia, a mistake that left him stranded for several days. It didn't help that he got drunk before some missions. In short, he was a liability. All of which may explain what happened on his tenth mission. On July 31, 1944, Saint-Exupéry took off on a mission over the Mediterranean. He was never seen again. Although wreckage from his plane was recovered in 2000, no body has ever been identified. It's possible he survived the wreck, but it's probably more likely that he drowned. To me, you will be unique in all the world. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Theodosia Burr Alston might not be a household name these days, but let's put it this way. Imagine the chaos if Ivanka Trump one day just vanished. America got a taste of that back in 1813 when Alston, the daughter of former Vice President Aaron Burr, stepped onto a small boat docked in Georgetown, South Carolina, and was never seen again. At the time, Alston, who was married to a wealthy South Carolina plantation owner, was as infamous as her father. Burr's duel with Alexander Hamilton had been brought on in part by rumors that the VP and his daughter were engaging in some hot and heavy incestuous loving. Then, when Burr headed out west to establish his own breakaway nation, it was Alston who bankrolled his megalomania. When he was tried for treason, she was there, and when he fled the country, it was with her help. All of this came at a cost. Alston was known to be desperately unhappy and suffering from chronic ill health after the birth of her child. After her father left the country and her son died, she slipped into an inescapable funk. When she vanished, it didn't take long for the public to put two and two together and make approximately five billion conspiracy theories. The truth is probably more mundane than any of them, including the one that suggests she ran off to be a pirate. 
Alston was sailing through fierce storms on a trip up the coast from South Carolina to New York, and the schooner never arrived, making it likely that the ship went down in the storm. In the two decades before rock and roll took hold, big bands ruled the music world, and there were few as successful and well-known as the operation run by Glenn Miller. After working as an arranger and trombone player, Miller formed his own band and scored one jazzy, brassy, era-defining hit after another, racking up 17 top 10 hits in 1939 and 31 in 1940. World War II interrupted Miller's career. He joined the Air Force as an officer, but still played war bond rallies and for his fellow military men. In 1944, the 40-year-old Miller took his act and his band to the UK, and on December 15th, he boarded a plane bound for Paris, where he was set to perform for troops. The small aircraft went up over the English Channel and was never seen again. According to Colorado Public Radio, conditions were bad that day, and it's possible that Miller's plane crashed into the English Channel after a malfunction caused by a frozen fuel intake line. While not a celebrity in the traditional sense, Jimmy Hoffa was incredibly famous as the president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, one of the country's largest and most powerful labor unions. That made him well known. The crimes for which he was convicted made him notorious, as did alleged connections with the world of organized crime. After a 1965 conviction by a federal jury for taking funds from a trucking company and trying to funnel a bribe to a juror's son, Hoffa stepped down as Teamsters president, but he still held sway in the organization. On July 30, 1975, 61-year-old Hoffa called his wife from a suburban Detroit restaurant to tell her that his lunch appointment with two known organized criminals was off because the guys had failed to show up. That's the last time anybody heard anything from Hoffa. Where did he go? There's the disproven urban legend that mobsters killed him and then buried him in Giant Stadium in New Jersey. And there's also a theory presented to a grand jury that Hoffa was the victim of a professional hit because he planned to reveal that the mob had taken control of the Teamsters and was funneling pension money into various criminal activities. At this point, it's likely we may never know the truth. The Incredible String Band was possibly the most countercultural late 60s band in existence, combining the folky, hippie musical stylings popular in the era with psychedelic rock which also resonated with young people at the time. Founded by Robin Williamson and Mike Herron, they added their respective girlfriends, Christina Licorice McKechnie and Rose Simpson, to the group and enjoyed some modest success on the lower runs of the Billboard album chart. That was thanks in part to the vocal and songwriting contributions of McKechnie, who bopped around on the fringes of the folk music scene in the 1970s. A native of Edinburgh, Scotland, McKechnie returned to the area in 1986 to visit relatives, and not long after, her whereabouts veered into the unknown. Her sister later suggested that McKechnie was in Sacramento recovering from surgery in 1990, while others had reported that McKechnie's last known sighting came when she was seen hitchhiking in the Arizona desert in 1987. Elania Carisi was essentially already famous at the moment she was born in 1970, her father Albano Carisi, a popular Italian singer in the 1960s. In 1970, Albano married American singer-songwriter Romina Power the daughter of mid-century movie superstar Tyrone Power, and they became a highly successful double act in Europe, as well as the parents of two kids, including Elenia. The younger Carisi made her entertainment debut in the 1984 Italian film Champagne in Paradiso before appearing in 1989 as a letter-turner on Italian's version of Wheel of Fortune. Five years after that, the 23-year-old Carisi disappeared. Taking a sabbatical from the University of London to research a novel, Carisi visited Florida and the French Quarter of New Orleans. She left her passport and luggage behind and never returned, and although she was declared dead in 2014, there's been speculation that her disappearance was purposeful. Vancouver-based musician Forrest Schaub was a rapper who performed under the stage name D.Y., an ominous abbreviation of his nickname, Die Young. He broke out big in 2009 and 2010, signed a deal with CP Records, released the hit club track Passenger, and toured Canada as an opening act for Akon. He was preparing to drop his second single, That's My Spot, and his first full-length album when, in August 2010, the 26-year-old rapper apparently flew from Toronto to Mexico. A few weeks later, he wished a friend happy birthday on his social media accounts, and that marked the last time Schaub would make contact with anyone. Schaub's family contacted the Toronto Police Service, whose search as to the rapper's whereabouts didn't turn up any viable leads. He remains missing today. A rising pop star in his native Chechnya and other North Caucasian states, Zelim Baka performed in Chechnyan and Russian, and recorded popular songs like Nana and Without You. Then, in 2017, he was set to compete on the Russian version of Star Academy, a reality show hybrid of American Idol and Big Brother. Until that is, 25-year-old Bekov traveled to the Chechnyan capital city of Grozny on August 8, 2017. 
Local LGBT community advocates allege that within hours of arriving in his hometown, Bekov was arrested and was sent to a government facility where he was tortured and killed, a victim of the country's efforts to eradicate gay people in Chechnya. Chechen President Ramzan Kadyrov publicly denied that his government had anything to do with Bekov's disappearance or possible death, suggesting instead that the singer's own relatives killed him because of his sexuality. Kadyrov said his family couldn't stop him and then called him back home, and his brothers, it seems, accused him. Isn't there anyone in the village, any man in the family who can admit, we did this? They know full well who it was. The singer's father, Kuzian Bekov, denied that this was the case and told Radio Free Europe, none of his relatives laid a finger on him. There was no reason to lay a finger on him. Forward guard John Brisker moved up to the NBA in 1972 when he signed with the Seattle Supersonics. His numbers in the Moore Premier League weren't quite up to snuff with what was expected, though, and he was cut from the Sonics in 1975. According to the Seattle Times, he went to Africa in 1978 to start up an import-export venture. On April 11, 1978, Brisker called his girlfriend from Uganda. Brisker was not seen or heard from again. It's possible he met his end in the violent coup that rocked Uganda that year. His former teammates entertained rumors that he was slaughtered and eaten by dictator Idi Amin, or that he angered the leader who then shot him. The U.S. State Department could not actually confirm if Brisker had ever traveled to Africa in the first place, but at any rate, in May 1985, the King County Medical Examiner in Seattle declared Brisker dead so that his estate could be settled. In 1939, the NCAA held its first ever men's college basketball tournament. The University of Oregon took home the win, and the champion players became minor celebrities, particularly towering star center Urgel Slim Wintermute. According to the Boston Globe, the All-American from Portland could dunk the ball, a novelty at the time. After college, Wintermute worked for airplane manufacturer Boeing in Seattle, married and fathered three children. In October 1977, the 60-year-old Wintermute took a boat out of Seattle adjacent Lake Washington with a friend. Sometime after his companion went to sleep on the large boat, he left the craft and was never seen or heard from again. The athlete's son told police that his father was on medication for heart issue and that he might have had a heart attack and fallen into the water. His remains were never recovered. In the 1930s, Amelia Earhart was an American hero and one of the most famous people on the planet, and with good reason. Earhart did amazing things with airplanes when aviation was still in its infancy, when the idea of humans flying by a mechanical means was all a delightful and inspiring novelty. In 1932, the National Women's History Museum says Earhart became the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean, unaccompanied, and she was awarded the Cross of the French Legion of Honor and the American Distinguished Flying Cross, among other achievements. In 1937, Earhart set out on a journey that would prove ambitious and mysterious. She aimed to be the first woman to fly all the way around the globe. Alongside her navigator, Fred Noonan, Earhart departed Miami on June 1st. By July 2nd, they'd made it to New Guinea with plans to hit Howland Island, a small uninhabited landmass between Hawaii and Australia. Sometime en route, Earhart, dealing with poor weather and low fuel, lost contact with the Coast Guard liaison. Her plane never landed, and it was never discovered nor were Earhart or Noonan, despite a joint Coast Guard and Navy search effort that encompassed 250,000 square miles. Her disappearance remains one of the most enduring mysteries of American history. In case you weren't listening, I'm not one to shy away from danger. Mm -hmm. How about Spears? You want to shy away from Spears? Hart Crane was a modernist poet in the mold of T.S. Eliot, writing in a flowery, intellectual, often tortured style, and he similarly became an emerging and leading figure in early 20th century American poetry. He was also compared to Walt Whitman, and he earned accolades for The Bridge, a long near-epic poem ostensibly about the Brooklyn Bridge, but really about the idea of America itself. Crane's father, Clarence Arthur Crane, was a wealthy chocolatier and candy maker, and Crane had a tumultuous relationship with the man. In April 1932, after the elder Crane had died, the poet had reportedly grown depressed, according to friends who spoke to the New York Times. After winning a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship and relocating to Mexico to write an epic poem about the 16th century conquest of Mexico, Crane boarded an ocean liner and was headed back to New York when, around noon one day, he either jumped into the Atlantic Ocean or fell. Crane, who was 32 at the time and reportedly struggling with his sexuality, did not leave a note and his body never surfaced. In the late 90s and early 2000s, child and teen actor Joe Pickler appeared in a series of small and supporting roles in a number of movies and TV shows, including Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, Touched by an Angel, Varsity Blues, and most notably in two direct-to-video sequels in the Beethoven family film franchise. And then he disappeared. According to The Charlie Project, Pickler spoke with a friend at about 4 a.m. on January 5, 2006 in his northeastern Washington hometown of Bremerton. 
It was a few weeks before his 19th birthday when he left his apartment untouched, unlocked, and with the lights on. He took only his wallet and car keys before he disappeared without telling anyone where he might be going. He left no clues behind aside from some poems that spoke to his depressed state. Four days later, Pickler's Toyota Corolla was located in Bremerton, and authorities suspected that Pickler may have jumped to his death off of a bridge over Port Madison Narrows, but no evidence of that nor his remains were ever recovered. If you were alive in 1910, Dorothy Arnold's name would have been extremely familiar. The disappearance of the 25-year-old socialite was the news story of the year, mixing wealth, scandal, and mystery into a single hyperactive news cocktail. A prominent celeb in New York City, Arnold vanished in the middle of Central Park in broad daylight. The subsequent case saw her star profile go supernova. The details of the case read like the pitch for hard-boiled detective drama. Things weren't going smoothly at home. Arnold had fallen out with her millionaire father, who refused to let her move out of the house. She kept a secret post office box no one knew about, possibly connected to her writing career. She was having a fling with a man 20 years her senior, George Griscom Jr., and had recently pawned her jewelry after meeting him. Then she went shopping one day and never returned. Arnold's rich dad was so worried about the bad publicity his disappearing daughter might bring that he didn't tell the police for months. He had hired his own gumshoes to investigate, and they turned up squat. There were rumors Arnold had been murdered by Griscom, rumors she'd committed suicide, and rumors she died in a botched backstreet abortion. Over a century later, no one is the wiser. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK-8255.